in the chat box so that we can discuss. Let me, there it is. Okay, somebody's typing. Hi, everybody, welcome. Please get your glasses of water or your coffee. Tell us who you are, where are you speaking from? Mine is here. Yeah, mine is here, so that's it. Hi, Eliane. Hi, Marcela. Hello, Eliane, Marcela. from São Paulo. Yes. Wow, Marcela is from over. Very chic. <laughs> São José. Hi, Adilha. Welcome. Well, I'm Taiwan. Hi, Alan. Wonderful. What time is it in Taiwan at this moment, Alan? Yeah. 3 a.m. Goodness! International crowd, yeah. A, Have Chile from Campo Grande, Mato Grosso, do Sul, right? Very good. Okay, so hi, I'm Chris. I'm from Rio Grande do Sul, but I'm speaking from Sorocaba, the countryside of Sao Paulo. I, 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 I thought about making my chimarrão to be here with you, but I forgot. <laughs> So I'm just going to have my water in here. <laughs> you can what call me Paula. I'm from Rio. I was born and raised in Rio. I'm speaking here from Rio as well. Very good. Silvia is from Campinas. Rita from Sao Paulo. See, we have people from all around. This is going to be really interesting when we think about Curitiba. I love Curitiba, Ju. I'm from Curitiba. And uh, we, we kindly ask you to keep sharing your own practices because culture has to do, has also a lot to do with where we are yeah. and the yeah. practices we have. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Jaraguá do Sul. Maria from Jaraguá do Sul, Santa Catarina. Uh, São Paulo. Fumi. 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 Águas de Santa Bárbara. Oh my goodness, I love it. Regiane Aparecida, Alcione. Alcione! Thank you! <laughs> we are among friends, aren't we, Paula? Yeah. I love it here. Okay. Everybody, thank you so much for joining. Hi, Marcia. And we really hope this is a moment for us to share ideas rather than just Paula and uh, I sharing some topics and some ideas, but I would also love for you to share your own practices and your own experiences with culture. Okay, so uh, as we have already mentioned, I'm from Sorocaba, the countryside of Sao Paulo. Paula is from uh, Rio, the capital, and we both work for Cultura Inglesa. So this webinar is uh, here for you because of Faculdade de Cultura Inglesa as well. And we're here to talk to you a little bit about tips to improve your students' intercultural awareness. And I would like to start by asking those 32 beautiful people here, 33 now, just because I said 32, what uh, are your intentions with this webinar? What do you hope to achieve? And why you decided to join a webinar about culture? Is this an issue for you? Is this something you are passionate about? Is this something you would like to know more? And what do you think we are going to be discussing? Take your time. No wrong answers here at all. Lilian, I like it. Widening cultural awareness. I like the use of the verb widen. Students are also interested. Yes. Yeah. Master says there is no language without culture. Both are essential to know more about. Hmm. More about. Very good. To know more about culture, per se, right? Yeah. So this is it. To teach better. Okay, definitely, Master. Alan said, yes. I'd like to learn how to have learn as express their identities in terms of culture. I love that, Alan. I love that. I really want you to keep that in mind because by the end, we are going to go back to see if we helped you. Not when I mentioned we, it's not Paul and I, but all of us in here, the 39 people in here. 
okay? We are, so remember that you can make comments about everything we have been discussing. Uh, we can stop our presentation to share some ideas and some insights. When we think about culture, it's not something that is top bottom. It's not something that Paula and I are going to come here and this is culture, this is it, this is that. But this is something that we are going to build together. Yeah, Eliana okay. says, because I like to pass on to students something about other cultures, mainly American British habits. Oh, I'm from Nigeria. I see lots of differences in perspectives and insight, even in teaching. Good one. Yeah. This is very interesting. The fact that we have people from overseas and from other continents mm -hmm. is going to help us immensely when we mention teaching practices because we teach very different people. If I'm teaching, I was teaching in Rio Grande do Sul and then I moved to Sao Paulo and I felt this difference. Imagine teaching in Brazil and then you move to Taiwan or Nigeria or you move to another country to teach a different kind of student. Very interesting. So let's get started. Is that lots, of, when, lots of things they've mentioned here will be uh, addressed in our webinar. Right, Chris? Yes, exactly. So if you have questions, you can put your questions here, you can make comments about it. And if we do not uh, address it, because it was in the structure, we are going to address it one way or another. Okay, so the idea is for all of us to share perspectives and to become uh, more open to what culture is and to what culture entails. So when we think about culture, usually what pops in our mind is Oh, we have books, you have history, you have paintings, you have um, architecture. Jo mentioned something interesting here, how to tackle culture while teaching English as a lingua franca. And then she works with BNCC. Jo, do you teach uh, regular schools, public and private schools? That's great. That is great. I think there is something that we can go there uh, that we can discuss together, especially because we are dealing with English as a lingua franca. This is a definition that makes a lot of difference when we think of. So culture, when we think about it, we, we always think, oh, the, the Americans, New York City and the, the Statue of Liberty, the British with the Big Ben and their habits and their fish and chips and they are very punctual. Americans have the American way of life. And that's pretty much it. We rely on these stereotypes. And sometimes we think that they are the only things that entail what culture is in a certain culture, in a certain country, for instance. And, but is there the only thing that there is? I like what Hita mentioned, the things which express the way people live. What are these things, Hita? Can you think of other examples? The things that express the way a person lives or the way people live. What are these things? Communication, okay? The way people communicate. But what are, the, what are those things? Excellent food, way of clothing, way of getting dressed, music, family, the jokes. I love that. I love that you mentioned jokes because that's a big part of culture. So what happens is when we are studying it, the concept of culture, uh, this author, Claire Kremsch, there is a paper called Culture in Foreign Language Teaching. You will have access to all of our references at the end of this webinar. But she mentions that there is a difference between culture with capital C and culture with lowercase c, little c and big c, or uppercase c and uh, lowercase c. When we think about the uppercase c, we think about uh, literature, arts, architecture, those quote unquote big things, those things that do not change uh, rapidly. So they are the, the, the ground to which other cultures are going to be built from. Whereas culture with Laura KC are all of these things that you have been mentioning here in the chat box. Food, 
music, celebrations, family. Family is also very interesting because we have different concepts of family and different ways that families get together. Paula and I were discussing this uh, yesterday when we got together to, to share ideas about this webinar. And we were talking about how families get together for lunch or for their meals, right, Paula? But sometimes we just talk about it and some families need that big table moment and having a meal is this big thing, whereas other families just get together in front of the TV. So this is also a way of expressing our everyday life. And these things should be working alongside the big C culture. Sometimes when we are teachers, we only think about culture as these big habits. Oh, the British, they like fish and chips. The Americans, they eat burger and fries and they have Thanksgiving and they have the 4th of July. And we rely only on these stereotypes. And that sometimes... Uh, that is a good start, but sometimes they need to be a little bit more. Uh... Hi, Anna, you're back. I'm back. I, I got a bit nervous. I'll stay. <laughs> that's okay. That's okay. Right here. And when we think about the lower case, see, all of these practices help the big C being shaped throughout ages and throughout the years. So for us, getting to know the little C culture, uh, ways of a culture to, to express themselves is going to help us with the big C culture as well. This paper by Claire Kremsch is very interesting. Literature, Hejani, yes, literature falls into the big C culture because we have all of these practices in the little C culture that help authors create, uh, write books and talk about their own cultures that are going to be uh, inserted here on the big C culture as well. Okay. This paper by Claire Crunch is very illuminating. If you feel like you want to understand a little bit about how to deal with culture and with our students, uh, I really, I really recommend you take, take a read at it. It's for free, uh, on the internet. Claire made it, uh, available. So what is the challenge for us as English language teachers? Let it be foreign uh, language teachers or English as a lingua franca teaching. The challenge for us is to prepare our students for this voyage of discovery. So you have a voyage of discovery and a return voyage when later in life students will rediscover who they are in light of their encounter with the other. And this is something that I would like you to bear in mind throughout the rest of our presentation. We are here to give you tips on how to improve intercultural awareness. But you can only be aware of the other if you understand and know who you are. So we are going to help students to see. Uh, her name is Claire Crunch, Adriana. Claire Crunch from 2013. The name of the paper is Culture in Foreign Language Teaching. But this is the thing. You can only understand the other if you understand who you are and what is your place in this world. Everything that we deal with, everything that we are going to show you has this as the ground rule. You need to make other people understand who you are and you need to understand who you are first and foremost so that you can understand an encounter with the other if the other is different or if the other is the same or similar, right? But Paula, I have a question for you. When we think about lowercase, uh, uppercase C, lowercase C, how can we make learners aware of this little C culture, of these practices that different cultures and different people have? How, how is this possible? All right, Chris. So uh, the point is that in this uh, global and increasingly a diverse society, we cannot disregard this little C culture any longer, right? Because by getting to know uh, other cultures in their minor aspects, uh, we might become more flexible, patient, respectful, and empathetic. And as we always see, um, learning opportunities, uh, the learning opportunities that this diversity 
can provide us with, right? And a valuing uh, one another's culture is fundamental for a successful communication to take place and for us to try to build a more reasonable society, yeah? And as educators, uh, we can start building the society in our classrooms by fostering an environment where uh, differences are celebrated, uh, above all, uh, are accepted, understood, respected, appreciated, especially if these differences have been historically neglected. Uh, and even though each of us has a culture, um, we have identities that are built from multiple cultures, yeah? And it's important to understand this diversity that we have in and out of the classroom uh, so that we can promote cultural awareness uh, by means of culturally responsive activities, strategies, and here, we are going to give you five tips on how to uh, promote cultural awareness in your classroom. And that will help your learners become more uh, culturally aware outside the classroom as well. And we are also going to briefly explain uh, what each of these tips uh, means and provide you with some examples. It's important to say that this list is not exhaustive and that some of these examples or activities might require more or less preparation and you should bear in mind when trying to implement these activities not only your students uh, level of uh, english your, the, the level of language but also their uh, interest and their profile for example something else to take into account is how flexible your schedule is and the resources you have at your disposal. Right? I and love that, Paula. These activities are doable considering your context, okay? And the first one is, can you show the first one, Chris? I can. Before I do show, I think Paula mentioned okay. something. I'm going to mention it again, okay. uh, especially because we have lots of different contexts uh, in which English is taught by these professionals here in the chat box. We have teachers who teach uh, public schools and private schools, like regular schools. We have teachers who teach in English schools. We, I think we might have people who teach bilingual schools as well. If you do teach bilingual schools, let us know here in the chat. So all of the tips that we give, they are not set in stone and they are not square. You do not have to do exactly as we say, and the results are going to be there. Uh, as Paula mentioned, the list is not exhaustive and yeah. we should bear in mind our group and also our curriculum because we do know that uh, some schools have more flexible curriculum, some schools have more strict curriculums. Yeah. So sometimes you can make small changes in the way things are presented to your students and have great results out of them. Okay, so it's uh, remember to bear that in mind and as you look at the tips and you think about your own context, Feel free to share ideas. I might get this idea and change it like this because my context, the city where I am at, my students uh, behave a certain way. My students might be more accepting of having this kind of activity. Share them here because sometimes somebody's question might be solved by your ideas as well. Collaborative uh, moment. Let's, let's take advantage of the fact that we can interact in this webinar, right? Right. So, Paula, what is tip number one? Yeah, first one is force and value a diverse environment. And what does it mean? Uh, well, it means uh, showing learners how diverse and plural the world we live in is and reinforcing how rich and positive it is. Uh, allowing your learners to understand that no cultures and people and peoples are better than others, for example letting them uh, share their own cultural practices, making them aware of differences and similarities, uh, helping them realize how much we learn from and with these differences and similarities, right? And uh, 
two examples here that we can give you to illustrate this tip are first one explore skin color with lanas this is uh especially useful with young lanas uh, this is a good way to make learners aware of differences and similarities. So you can allow them to mix uh, a few paint colors to create different skin tones for decorating characters, for example. And these characters uh, can be used to create um, a context for you to um, uh, work on language with them. Uh, and when creating these characters, you can allow learners to find the color they feel uh, match them. And this way they will feel represented. And you can also give them some autonomy uh, and this context will be more meaningful for them as well. One more example of activity to illustrate this tip is uh, hosting a cultural fair. For example, you can plan a fair, a cultural fair, uh, through which learners can share knowledge about uh, traditional clothes. Remember, here are talking about uh, little C culture as well, mainly uh, traditional clothes, kinds of food, customs, rituals, beliefs, uh, traditions, uh, and more from different countries or even regions within our own country. So here, for example, we have people from all over and we can see how different we are. And uh, it's important to favor regions uh, which haven't been widely uh, explored in books and films, for example. Someone here said that uh, they enjoy talking about American and British cultures. Why not uh, go beyond and, uh, and talk about other cultures which are not that explored uh, in books and films traditionally, right? And this is I a love that. opportunity yeah, for, for uh, mm -hmm. learners to, to, to learn about differences and similarities and uh, better uh, appreciate these cultures as well. Uh, Something that is interesting here, let me just compliment that, Paula, is uh, something that we know, but sometimes we tend to forget. Do not underestimate your learner's cultural background. You know, sometimes we try to bring, oh, did you know that in the United States, uh, usually after college, uh, kids leave their parents' house and they're going to look at you and say, yes, I've been watching lots of TV shows. I follow these bloggers online. Uh, in this globalized world, students are prone to interacting with different cultures way more easily and way more frequently than we did when we were learning English. I was talking to Paula, I learned English, my contact with English culture via Britney Spears back in the early 2000s, uh, that we had to buffer to listen to songs, to watch music videos. And nowadays everything is ready at the touch of a hand. So why not go beyond? Do not underestimate your students. Some things might be obvious, of course, you need to get to know them, but then, why not go uh, and, and show students about other cultures, uh, other countries that have English as an official language? And, and, and countries which are not uh, English-speaking countries as well. Exactly. They can serve as context for you to work on language as well. You'll be talking about other things and then uh, work on the English language at the same time. One more example here, make sure there is diversity in instructional materials. This is something very, very important. So you should look critically at your instructional resources so as to increase diversity. And then here it's important to ask yourself some questions. For example, are you using a range of books and materials that reflect uh, different voices and backgrounds and experiences, for example, if you are supposed to use institutional course books, uh, do they reflect these differences? If not, uh, are you allowed to make any adaptations in the sense, if you use your own material, your own handouts, uh, do you use images that are inclusive? So it's always important to review and adjust your material accordingly 
so that your students not only get to know about other cultures, but also feel represented, okay? Uh, let's move on. Yes. Number two is the archive. Here yeah, we have some examples of how we can. I love those pictures. Yes. Color, right? Just for you to see. I don't. I don't know about you. Oh. I don't. I, I come from Rio Grande do Sul, so it's still very difficult for me. I was talking. I was telling Paula yesterday uh, that it is embedded in my mind to look at the salmon color of colored pencils and say skin tone in Portuguese, yes. cor de pele for salmon. What is skin tone? Who's what the is skin, skin tone? tone? Who's exactly. Skin tone? Mine, yours. Yeah. Exactly. Or even nude. Exactly. So how can we uh, make it more diverse? Because sometimes our class might not be as diverse as, uh, as our country or as culture per se, but we can start making a difference by these very small changes instead of calling it skin tone just call it salmon brown light brown so that students can feel welcome to make those changes as well we are the actors of change right and they so can also we have create different... their own characters as well take this yes. opportunity to give them some more autonomy and, and the thing is, when we think about shades of skin, uh, you can insert this inside pretty much any young learner activity, right? You want to teach parts of the body, you can talk about shades of skin. You want to have any kind of drawing, basically, you can shed some light into that discussion. Definitely. Very good. Next what is money. tip number two, Paula? Oh, tip number two is help learners engage in critical thinking skills. And what does it mean, Chris? So it means helping learners become critical thinkers, the kind of people who will never accept anything without um, uh, evaluation, reflection, without considering different impacts and alternatives. And how can you do that? What kinds of activities can you carry out with your students so as to promote critical thinking? You can promote discussions based on true events, for example. This is especially useful with upper intermediate and advanced students, for instance. Uh, make use of authentic materials um, like piece of news, snips of documentaries. You can have learners reflect upon, for, as you're talking about, cultural awareness, have them reflect upon uh, how cultural awareness and cultural bias uh, impact our lives. And depending on the level of autonomy your learners have, you can encourage them to select and bring their own material to the classroom. Again, it's going to make this activity much more meaningful. And the second uh, kind of activity you might carry out so as to promote um, critical thinking skills is uh, to organize learning experiences that promote critical thinking. One good example are projects. So project-based learning involving cultural aspects, for example, and why? Because every time we deal with uh, project-based learning, we uh, have a real-life uh, problem and then students are supposed to find solutions to these problems. And these solutions are not uh, always obvious. Sometimes there is more than one possible solution. And then students have to think about the pros and cons and uh, they need to um, think about uh, these solutions from different perspectives and they have to consider uh, the positive and negative points and collaboratively they have to uh, think about uh, which one uh, is the most suitable or the most effective. And again, they, they have to be good listeners and they need to take uh, other people's points of views into consideration. And again, culture plays an important role here, right? Active listening, right, Paula? Well, do you have anything to add here? I do. It's because you were talking and, and I was just writing in the chat box. Uh, PBL is very interesting. It's something we are more used to. But uh, if I may add something new and a challenge, if you are not aware, 
get to know what design thinking is and how you can apply design thinking uh, steps into your classroom, you know, especially dealing with experiences that promote critical think thinking and also thinking about the true events and the community around you. Okay, this is something interesting because design thinking helps you look outside and see what is around you and how can you make what is around you even better. So I love that. Remember that critical thinking is one of the 21st century skills that we are invited to help students uh, foster and develop as well. And it widens the scope. Exactly. This is the thing. We want our students, we want to take those... Um, not not help them just see the objective but see everything around them and that the objective does not need to be just a point in front of you but there is so much around you as well very very interesting uh point Marcel. what is tip number three paula wow bring up minor aspects of culture remember what chris said about you know uh <laughs> um little c culture so again it means uh, considering that cooking behavior, science, values, among other aspects are always in which different people and peoples express their culture. So uh, why not go beyond the classical tea time in England or the New York City hot dog? Here, uh, two suggestions we can give you. Celebrate culture and diversity through cooking all right so food course, yes it all depends on where you work depending on the structure of the school where you work uh you can cook with your students that might be an incredible experience through which students uh will learn about different spices ingredients and cooking methods used around the world or even within your own country again because when you talk about brazil so we have uh, an array of uh, different kinds of food. And again, my suggestion here is uh, that to favor cultures or groups that aren't widely known or commonly discussed. Yeah. There, and, there is something uh, interesting that you can do with that, Paula. Uh, and, and this is a joke that I myself love to make because I am originally from Rio Grande do Sul, but I'm living in Sorocaba. And if you are Brazilian, or especially if you are from Sao Paulo, or if you know the state of Sao Paulo, you know that my city here, Sorocaba, is famous for its coxinhas. So ah, you have okay. pastry made with like mashed potatoes and chicken, you know, and, but if you think about Brazilian culture, you're not going to mention coxinhas. They're going to mention, I don't know, Arroz, uh, rice and beans, feijoada. 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 So when you make students aware that you have this minor C, uh, uh, culturally gastronomical aspects, cooking aspects, you can open their horizons to understand that this also happens in other countries. Yeah, That's why yeah. we go beyond tea time in England and go beyond New York City hot dogs, you know? And Having please, students and family teaching. And, yes, Paolo. Uh, uh, still thinking about this little C culture and, and, and really minor aspects of culture. Uh, and going beyond food itself, we can also, the students can also discuss rituals people have when they are around the table at meal times. Yes. So they can discuss not only recipes and spices and flavors, but also what people do at meal times, right? And, and how relevant the it is to be around home. Yeah. And to, to value students' background, because we also have our rituals at home. Some people sit at the table to, to, to eat with the families. Some people eat in a different way. Some people use their hands to eat. And you can allow students to bring their own recipes, or maybe they can uh, take photos or record themselves or any relatives cooking, and they can share uh, family recipes with their, their peers and talk about what they do uh, and, and how they celebrate certain dates uh, by means of, uh, uh, again, rituals around the table, right? Exactly. And this is the thing, like, I don't know if you, 
if you paid attention to everything we have been discussing, and even Alan mentioned the festivals in Taiwan here with rice dumplings and mooncakes, uh, we need to look inside. You need to look around us before we look uh, abroad. So it's not only about, oh, but I need to know what cultures are doing abroad. There are so many countries, so many cultures. You can be open to what you are doing, your family does, and your students' families do, and then they will be more prone to recognize those uh, habits or seeing different habits uh, related to their own in TV shows, in their practices, inside the classroom and outside the classroom as well. So it's much about fostering and preparing the land so that when they receive, they know how to tackle it, not just to find it strange, but to find it different in light than the encounter with the other. They will know themselves in light uh, of the encounter with the other. Definitely, right. So. Uh, one more example, we'll make room for multicultural decoration. So you can have a kind of cultural corner or something similar to that. So each mountain can be decorated based on a different cultural group. Uh, learners can bring um, different elements that represent that specific culture. Uh, flags, pictures, text and, you know, instruments, artwork. Uh, you name it, and objects in general. Once again, uh, you can go beyond the stereotypes. So you can talk about some cultures that are not exactly uh, uh, widely known, right? One more example here. Is it here? I don't think it's on the slide, but you can mention it. Ah, uh, okay. It's not on the slide. Uh, it's an Easter egg. Uh, okay, would be uh, taking virtual uh, field trips with technology, so we can do it. You can take your learners to another country or another destination in your own country, and these places may be completely off the beaten track. This is my suggestion, by the way. And uh, learners can make the choices, and then you can allow them to express themselves about these places they've just been to virtually uh, by means of words, creating posters, drawing, for example. And again, to make it more meaningful and depending on how autonomous they are, you might allow these students to not only choose the destination, but also to conduct these trips, okay? Uh, you mentioned going beyond the stereotypes. I love the use of beyond here. As you mentioned, avoiding the stereotypes. I understand your point, Ju, but I think that you can shed lights on why these stereotypes are stereotypes and then go beyond. Oh, some people mentioned this, but why is that? Is, is this the only thing that there is for this culture? Like, oh, Brazilians are warm or Brazilians are always late we can go a little bit beyond and help them understand that stereotypes do exist. Uh, it's it's uh, a start when we think about cultures, when you get to know, but at the moment that you understand that that's not the only thing there is relating to, related to those cultures, we can promote critical thinking as well. So this is, this is very interesting. I like that discussion. And multicultural decorations is also interesting because we are very visual. And, yes, yeah. and, and then having that, those decorations in your classroom, if you have the opportunity of having a classroom for yourself or maybe having a poster or having something uh, on the hallways that can so be- just can take the initiative as well. They might decide when to change this decoration as well. I like that as well. Very good. We do have two more tips for you. Oh my God. So far. Yes. Yeah, yes. And you know that we do we, we have like oh. those five tips, but they are that are like sub tips. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so after all, you're going to have tip number four. More than five. Tip number four. So let Lana's take over. Okay. Me. What does it have to do with culture? So it has to do with culture because uh, having a culture-centered classroom, which also involves having a learner-centered approach 
where learners can uh, 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 contribute. Uh, has everything to do with uh, this environment that we, uh, we want to create, right? Uh, here, the idea is that uh, you allow your learners to create a quilt out of different perceptions of themselves and of the world around them. Examples of activities. You can let uh, learners create a collage. This is wonderful. This works really well with young learners. You can allow them to share who they are by means of this kind of uh, activity. They can explain why they selected some elements. Um, uh, these elements can be displayed on walls for everyone to take a look or to, to talk about. Um, the idea here is to express our interest in students' background. Again, it helps foster uh, a trusting relationship in, in the classroom. And here we are celebrating differences, traditions, beliefs, and social behaviors. Again, talking about the Little C culture, right? Activity number two, have learners create a diversity quilt. We are going to show you some images in a while, okay? So it's through these there. activities, uh, learners will express themselves as well on their own square. They can talk about, they can express, not talk about, but they might express uh, um, them, themselves uh, in terms of uh, their habits, their family customs, etc. while having a board that represents the whole group. And here, um, we, we can have a kind of visual reminder that uh, even though we uh, have our own characteristics that we're all different, we are very similar in, in lots of uh, things as well. So we have uh, similarities and differences that must be celebrated once again, right? And taking virtual trips, it's a good uh, activity for us to let learners take the lead, especially if we allow them to choose the destination and to conduct these trips. And let learners produce global art that can be based on the trips they've taken, for instance. They can create art inspired by a piece from, okay, you can talk about mainstream places and landmarks, and like the Great Wall of China, they can uh, create this Great Wall of China. Uh, they can make it um, out of popsicle sticks. But whenever possible, go beyond the small obvious places and landmarks. Uh, they can visit, for example, uh, a remote village where there are skillful craftsmen, for instance. And then let learners uh, produce uh, their own uh, piece of art uh, based on what they saw there in that village according to their own perspectives of the place, right? Chris, can you show them the images of the cultural? It's already there. Video? All right, so you see, yeah. this is an example. Of course that they can express themselves by means of these images and they can, depending on that level of language, they can also describe what they see. Their peers can make some comments on what they see. They can identify these differences and similarities, what, what they found interesting, what they've learned about their peers as well, okay? And you can, and this is the thing about the cultural quilt, you can work with it differently. Uh, in this example, you have a cultural quilt uh, connected to countries. So each kid had to choose a country and talk about their fashion, their food, and then their habits. And then they would look at it and compare. But you can think about your family, you can think about your school, you can think about uh, a country or a place, a city that you visited, so that you can see these differences and similarities. When they, can think about interview, they can interview the families, the relatives. Yes. And think yes. About the origin. So, oh, my, my yeah. grandma is from China and my grandpa is from uh, Greece, for instance. And they can mm -hmm. ask them about... Uh, the habits when they were kids, why not? And how these habits impact the habits they have now in the family, so why not? Exactly. And it's when we show them that even though they have a culture now, 
the yes. identities were built from multiple cultures. Exactly. If you want to uh, be a little more like if if you have adult learners and they are not yet prepared no. to go that beyond, because we know that sometimes we have some resistance from them. Oh, I'm here mm -hmm. to learn American culture or to learn British culture. So you can get them together. No, but this is the thing, Paula. It's not looking at them saying, no, you're not. But you, you can twist them. What about separating them and go like, okay, we are going to talk about American culture. You are going to be responsible for California. You're going to be responsible for Canada. Mm -hmm. yeah. You're going to be responsible. So it's a way that you can uh, split them and they're going to have to do their own research and fill out this quilt. And by the time they share, they are going to understand that we're not going to be talking about an American culture or a United States culture, because just like Brazil, they are very different. This is a they huge very country. Culturally diverse. Yeah. Yes. Lots so of making them aware, making states, them yeah. aware that this is here is going to widen their horizon so that later on you can have a cultural quilt about English speaking countries. And then That's you can get like African countries, Asian countries, European countries as well. So it's sometimes we have this tendency, oh, we want to make everything diverse. We want people to understand, but we have walked a long way to be here. Sometimes our students haven't. How can we make this so that they just don't feel like, oh, my teacher is here trying to impose her agenda? Oh, no, it's not like that. You are going to walk together with your students. And again, you need to know them so that you know where you can open a bit more and where can you hold it so that they are going to be able to open it later on. And then you make a cultural-centered cultural uh, classroom and a student-centered one. Yeah, and it has, has to do with, please, it has to do with the next tip. Yes. Which is, and this is the the most and be open to learning, right? So as a teacher, you should engage with your learners and go beyond being able to ask the questions because teachers tend to study to be ready so as to be ready to answer questions the students might have regarding the topic being discussed in the classroom. So uh, see yourself as a learner as well, as a lifelong learner, right? And join them as a peer on this uh, learning journey. And how can you do it? First of all, be a lifelong learner and let your learners know that because you are an example, you are the role model. If you are a lifelong learner, they will be lifelong learners as well. So, for example, do research on different cultures, share your findings with them, use your findings as meaningful context to uh, work on language. Don't be afraid to show you don't know everything. So look up information together with your students whenever uh, you don't know something or you want to know more about something, right? Uh, change your role from uh, instructor to facilitator. But what does it have to do with culture? Again, uh, isn't it the mindset that you want to change in the classroom? And if we have this authoritarian classroom, we are going to reinforce uh, this perceived sense of social injustice which is closely related to cultural bias, right? And in a culturally diverse classroom, which is our aim here, not only are people open to knowing, uh, understanding, valuing, and respecting different cultures, but uh, they also break away from a power relations to favor a more collaborative uh, environment. So here, make room for students to say what they'd like to learn or talk about, allow them to bring their own material to share their stories, so value their background. They always have something to say, to share with you. So be a good listener. And it's important to uh, uh, do what you preach because sometimes yes. uh, we are so pressed for time as we are now, and then we are uh, so eager to cover content that we, we don't stop to, to, to listen to students carefully and attentively. Students raise their hands to say something. Say, oh, just a minute, just a minute. So 
if you're telling them that they should listen to, to each other attentively and they should understand each other, see, we should be uh, their models as well. And oh, Paula, what their contributions. Okay? I want to set the conversation on fire, and so does Liliane. She asked here, what do you do if a student comes out with prejudiced views? Hmm. You run out of the oh. door. No, I'm kidding. You don't. <laughs> okay, we cannot uh, let the students get away with murder, first of all, right? Of exactly. course, that we to talk to the students kindly, but we do need to bring this topic to discussion. Right. Yeah, I think there are different levels of prejudiced views, you know, mm -hmm. uh, I'm not going to say like you should do this or you should do that because a person can have an opinion on, I don't know, gun control. That is a very controversial topic, but a person can be just racist. So it's different levels of dealing with that. You know, uh, it, it doesn't have a specific answer. I think uh, you should bring it to the table. Uh, when, when it happened, I had a, a student... I had a, a heated discussion on gun control well, in one class. And that's not necessarily prejudice, it's just controversial. And a person asked something and she mentioned something really controversial. And then I just asked the others, what do you feel about that? And then for this topic, I decided that I myself would not say what my point of view was because I felt that students were profiting much more from their discussion because sometimes they look at the teacher as the person who has the knowledge. So what the teacher says, what the teacher believes is the right. And if I believe something otherwise, I'm the wrong one. And this is something we have to deconstruct because right. we do not own knowledge. But we should. Again, you are making room for them to talk. And you are promoting critical thinking skills as well. Exactly, exactly. But Liliane, I think like if a student of mine that if, if, if they come up with prejudiced views, but like racist ones are ones that are prejudiced in a very difficult way, I myself would uh, interrupt. In that case, if, if I think about like racist yeah. points of view, I would interrupt at the moment. Don't there tell them off. Don't levels. tell them off. But no. Try to bring this to discussion, but in a nice way. And again, yes. uh, uh, trying to, 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 to make them uh, um, uh, reflect upon it exactly. as a group. As a group. Yes. And in the um, one, depending yeah. on the uh, level of language. That makes sense. Yes. Be mindful of that as well. Uh, Alan mentioned a quote by Dr. Cliff Norger. They started okay. questioning the collective beliefs of society and found that my reality was limited by my education. And my education was limited by the beliefs of my educators. Perfect. <clears throat> totally that is very really deep what we have just discussed here. Yep, yeah, exactly. exactly. It says so much about our, uh, our responsibility. We're not here to limit. Exactly. I love this quote, uh, Alan. And in order for us to start wrapping up, uh, all of the things we have been discussing, sometimes they might seem natural for us or something, uh, yeah. quote unquote, nat uh, like natural and obvious, but they might not be for our learners or sometimes not Please. all of them might be. Yes. Let me say something that will connect to what you, you're going to say next, because Fabiano said here, besides, we cannot expect that discussions we have in class will change students' views overnight. Thank you for saying that, Fabiano. And why not, Chris? We're not preaching. And this, this has to do, Fabiano, with this quote. Uh, for those who know me, I'm a, I'm a musical buff. I love musical theater. There's this quote from a Hamilton, an American musical, calling that this is not a moment. It's just a movement that we have exactly. to Exactly. This is a movement. We're not going it's to change fine. it. And this, and this is the thing. We're not there to preach. We are there to open our minds and change will come slowly but steady. Just like education. <laughs> slow and steady one step at a time and helping students to see themselves in light of the encounter with the other you know 
And if there's something that we want to leave you with is that, that all of the tips that we have been giving you, they are not uh, miracle workers. They are just not going to mention, going to have your students rethink everything they have been taught for years, but they will help you understand that it's one step at a time. Exactly. It's, and it takes time, takes a lot of work as well. It's not easy. After all, we live in a multicultural society. Exactly. And you're not going to change one. Exactly. We have some time for questions. If you have questions for us, mm -hmm. I'm going to put here the, the question and answers that you can, you can ask questions here. And also, if you want to click on the link here in the chat, you will be able to have uh, our presentation, okay? And here are some of the references that we used while we were preparing this presentation. Uh, some of them you can find online, some of them you can buy the book online as well, but I highly recommend all of them here, okay? And these are our email accounts if you want to get in touch with us, if you want to continue this conversation outside the... Time uh, flies. Oh my God. It does, it's right? Five. <laughs> Paula, any final takeaways? Ah, don't forget to, to visit uh, Faculdade de Cultura Inglesa website. Yes, okay. the link is here. You can okay, also so take a look at all of the courses that we have been offering, yeah. extension courses that can help you as well. Extension okay. courses for teachers. And don't that's forget it. to visit. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining. Thank um, you. Hope you've enjoyed and hope um, you can um, uh, implement these activities in your classrooms. Yes, do let us know uh, if they do work out, okay? Thank you so much. Hope to see you again soon. This webinar will be made available. It's already live on Facebook and will soon be made available on YouTube as well. Okay. Thank you so much. Have a great Wednesday. Thank you. Bye-bye. It was a pleasure.